Okay, we're good. All right, so um, I was hoping to have a better presentation today, um, but I figured I'm just gonna do something anyway, just to get, get it out there and, um, and maybe generate some discussion. Um, so uh, this is a very, from a very high level perspective, we have these two sort of neuroscience goals. It's, uh, uh, and one is to understand the functions of cortical column, and that means mapping it, that functionality under cortical anatomy and physiology. And the second is to understand how columns work together with other parts of the brain. So I'm just focusing on a single column again today. Um, and I've been working on various aspects of this over the last few months. Um, and uh, I'm just going to tell you about one idea I've been pursuing, which hasn't been fruitful yet, but I want to share it with you anyway. Um, so um, just, to, just again, in, in, we'll start with some basic review. It's always good to do that. We think about a column that generally, or the neocortex as a whole, the generally accepted view is that you have some sort of sensory input. Um, there's also an idea that there's a motor input, which is typically referred to as an efferent copy that's coming from someplace else in the brain. And, and the CPG is a central pattern generator. That would be a subcortical structure. And then the cortical co uh, cortex also has a motor output, which goes projects back to those CPGs and controls them. Um, I think most neuroscientists would agree with this basic uh, description, although they don't think about it too much, a lot of them. Um, what, we're, what we've done in the Thousand Brain series is every individual column does this. It's not just the neocortex as a whole, but every individual column learns models through sensing and moving and sensing and moving. This is the basic layout for how um, things in the world are learned. We move, we sense, we move and sense, we build a model um, of the thing that way, and then that model lets us generate behaviors to achieve certain goals. Um, recently, I proposed an alternate view to this. Oh, I'm sorry, before I go on. So this basic idea, if you're gonna, if this is true, um, which we're pretty certain it is, then uh, we basically sense that every column has some sort of, has to have some sort of reference frame and path integration. There's a motor input, essentially, the point of that is to, to move you to, uh, to, to know where you are on the sensed object or this, this, the thing you're modeling. And so you need some sort of reference frame in which to build the model of the object, and you have to do path integration using your motor input. Uh, again, these are ideas that are not really controversial, but most people don't think about them occurring in every column. Um, they, and most people don't think about them too much, but uh, they're not, in general, they're not too controversial. Um, recently, I, I presented this slide of, of a month or two ago, I don't know, maybe it was six months ago, I can't remember, <laughs> where I said this, I, I proposed an alternate way of thinking about um, the motor input to a column. And that alternate way looks more like this, is, is that the, um, that there's really two types of sensory input to a column. There is, in vision, we would think of it as the parvocellular and the magnocellular inputs. And uh, one represents flow, uh, in, the, in this case it would be optic flow, and the other represents more of a static input. And that actually, and I made the argument that um, this is the main um, motor input that a, a column uses to learn. Uh, it, it doesn't start with the, with the um, uh, with the efference copy from uh, from the CPG, but it starts basically it infers movements and infers it infers movements by looking at uh, large scale flow of input bits. Uh, I won't. I'm not going to go through all those slides, but I presented this idea recently. I don't know if, if everyone was there. I assume maybe maybe Niels, you weren't there for that. I don't know. Um, but. Um, and I think there's a lot, I, there's a lot of evidence supporting this, and I think it's actually right. And I think even though I talked about here in terms of vision, I think it occurs, it, it, it applies to anything you're modeling. Um, you have a sensory organ, or you have some bits of information that are coming from someplace. It could even be uh, another cortical region. And, um, and by observing how those, those uh, bits flow, you can determine what are the basic movement vectors that are being operated on in that case. Uh, in this case, then there's still a motor efference copy and there's still a motor output um, as before. These are documented features. Um, so in vision, you, you get a, the, the visual cortex gets input from the superior colliculus indicating uh, how it's moving the eyes uh, and, and the cortex can project back to the superior colliculus in this particular example. But I, I, I put those as secondary. That is, the, the way the column learns the model, its objects, is not 
by first observing those things, uh, the efforts copy observes by observing the sensory data itself. And then um, it can then learn to associate its model, its, its, its uh, representations of movement with uh, projections from the, from the subcortical projections. And it can learn to do this, you know, it can learn to basically anticipate movements uh, from efference copies. Where, but I'm you mind if I ask a question or should sure. I wait? No, go ahead, go ahead. Good. The, um, is your proposal that input, uh, magnocellular input is capable or the column V of that input is capable of differentiating between self movement and object movement? In other words, me moving my eye and an object moving in front yeah. of me? And in that email I sent you this morning, I, I mentioned that briefly. I'm going to get to that. Okay. Um, at, at this point, yeah, and that was part of this proposal. Um, uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, um, this, the, where I came from on this, uh, Max, is that I made this very simple observation. That I can watch someone playing a video game, and I don't know what actions they're taking, but I can just watch the screen. And I can path integrate and understand where they are. And I can observe, I can build a model of the world that that video game player is, is, is navigating. Hmm. And um, I don't need to know what actions are taking. I can just take the visual input and learn that same model of the world that they're learning. And that told me that there was sufficient input um, in, the, uh, in the visual stream um, uh, to, to do that. Hmm. Um, uh, one, so one second here, guys. I'm just going to, um, I'm going to ask my wife to be a little quieter. There's my, uh, I can't get my, uh, uh, one second. I'm trying to find, <laughs> I'm trying to find uh, my mute button. Um, well, I can't find it. Uh, hey, Janet, could you just try to be a little quieter, please? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't need to share that with you all. <laughs> um, it was very respectful the way you asked. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question on that previous yeah, slide? Let me get back to where I was here. Uh, how do I use oh, I'm in the wrong presentation here. One second. One second. I got all screwed up here. Um, there we go. Um, the previous slide. Uh, this slide? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I just want to say uh, the sense flow input is that somehow it's it's actually process that it actually is kind of like a flow vector or is it just something that is differentiated from the static input and it infers the flow from the fact that there are differences. Uh, I not sure I understand the question completely. Um, uh, first of all, uh, maybe maybe phrase it again, Kevin. Just say that. Just say it again. Okay, so, so you have a static input. So I'm just wondering when you say the sense flow input, is that just, is it literally something that's processed the thing and says, here's what's different about this thing and this is the flow? Or is it something that says, here's something different and inside that your rectangle, it senses, it, it generates a flow because you have a reference versus something that's static. I, I think it's the former. Um, in the in the in the Magnus, if there are these two really basic separated inputs, um, this is in vision, but I think the same thing is going on elsewhere, um, going into the visual cortex, and these these are there's a different pathways from the retina, and the magnocellular um, uh, bits, if you will, and I call them that, are very sensitive to change, so they 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 represent a, a, a change in a dot of light on a screen. And so they, if you put them, uh, give them a static image, they don't respond, but if it's changing, they respond. Um, they're also very broad in area. Um, so they represent much larger spaces where they're very fast, they represent change, um, they will not represent a static input. And, um, uh, and what I'm arguing, that you're gonna argue in a moment, that those are, those are ideal for, for detecting flow. And, and I presented, like, maybe I should have done the whole presentation again, but I presented earlier, papers that showed that um, uh, complex cells and in, in visual cortex really are not detecting movements of edges. They're just flow patterns. They're just optic flow. And you can give them any, they actually respond better to random bit patterns than they do to structured bit patterns. Um, um, they just, they, they're really just determining flow. So on its own, you don't need anything else. You just look, these, this magnocellular pathway says, hey, I'm, um, uh, I can detect when there's large flow patterns over the visual field. Um, and the parvocellular cells are the opposite of that. They, they do respond statically, 
They're slower responding, so they wouldn't be triggered very easily if something was moving, and they are much smaller receptive field sizes. Um, did that help you? Yeah, uh, I, I just you know wanted to know whether the uh, uh, it was so the, the the processing that there's flow is occurring externally, and and somehow that is. Is coded it, 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 it's it's, it's, it's coming right from the retina. The retina doesn't encode flow, but it encodes these two different types of inputs. Uh, so the evidence we have right now is that the actual axons that are representing the magnocellular do not represent flow. They just represent very fast changing um, uh, bits that are that represent change. And um, um, but when you get to the cortex, there are multiple types of cells. We'll talk about in a second. There's these complex cells and simple cells, and there's two different types of complex cells and they seem to represent flow. So how that's being calculated exactly is not clear, but the inputs are what you need to create that. Okay. Um, uh, and as, as soon as I pointed out last time I presented this, very, this is a new idea. I mean, this is not how people think about it. They think about, you know, everything in the cortex is, in the visual cortex is all about, you know, orientations and things like that. But um, actually that's not the evidence. The evidence is that the complex cells are not like that. Um, it's just people have forgotten it, it's old data. Anyway, so that's this idea. Uh, I, I think this, I'm really, this all, the more I think about it, I'm very convinced that this is actually happening. Uh, so I, I, even though it's speculative and it's a hypothesis, um, I don't view this as, um, as um, uh, low likelihood, I mean, it's very high likelihood. Okay, so now given that, now I just have a new picture of what a column is getting for its input. Um, and, uh, and, and I have to be careful when I say a column, I'm including like the thalamus with it, you know, it's like, and maybe even parts of the striatum, we don't really know. It's just like a column is able to do these calculations. Clearly part of that is how it, it, uh, it, it's part of the thalamus and is involved and I'm not showing that specifically. Now we can say, well, what are the things we, over the years, we've talked about all the things a column has to do. Um, one of the things is that if you think about it this way, the, these inputs coming in this case, again, I'm going to also focus on vision, but I don't think it has anything to do with vision. You've got two different reference frames going on here. If, I, if this is a primary sensory region, you'd have an egocentric reference frame, which is where your data is coming from. So if I'm detecting uh, input on the retina and I'm detecting flow due to my eye movements or due to the object moving, uh, well, at least due to my eye movements, then that's an egocentric. Um, um, those, if I my, move my eye to left, then that movement is an egocentric movement. It's, it's not in the object space. Uh, and, and similarly movement, the motor inputs and outputs of the cortex are gonna be in egocentric coordinates. But we wanna build a model of something not in egocentric coordinates. We wanna build it in allocentric coordinates. And so there has to be a, um, a reference frame transformation going on. And, uh, and the other people have written about this and it's become more and more clear to me that this is, this is happening all the time in every cortical column that there's a reference frame transformation going on. Even if I just consider like, oh, you know, what's the, if I'm moving my eyes, my eyes are moving relative to my head, but then, you know, um, I move my head, it's relative to my body, and I move my fingers, relative to my hand, and so on. There's this, this constant, uh, you just, every time a, a cortex, a, a column of the cortex models something, it has to take a set of inputs in one space and convert it into a set of, uh, a set of coordinates or a set of uh, properties in one space, convert it into a set of another space. So I've now come to believe that this is a fundamental component of what's going on in every cortical column. We haven't always talked about it that way, but you know, we, we knew this had to happen. Uh, but I've, I've come to realize that this is like a key thing that it's going on everywhere. So we've had a, here's a, a list of things that we've talked about uh, multiple times in the past that, um, that we know cortical columns must do. And I'll just, just go through them very quickly here. I just talked about the bi-directional reference frame transforms. By the way, it has to be bi-directional because I need to go from the model to make a prediction and go from the model. If I want to make a movement relative to some object, I have to then convert that into a movement relative to my body. And so it has to go both ways. Um, we know that um, to, to do some kind of reference frame, we, we believe there's grid cells. Uh, so we know there has to be grid cell modules in a column. Um, I've been proposing that these are actually 1D and we were talking about that just the other day. Um, we also know there have to be displacement cell modules and those would also be 1D. Um, just to review, we haven't talked about displacement cells a lot here, although it was in our 2019 paper. Um, you need displacement cells for two things. You need it to calculate the movement to get from one location to another location and you need it to learn compositional structure of objects. Um, so if I have two points on two different objects, then the displacement tells, tells me how to go between those, it tells me where those two objects are relative to each other. Um, 
it's an important concept that we've proposed, although it's it's not it's not it's outside of us. No one ever talked about it. Um, we also know that a column has to attend to a series of objects to learn compositional structure. So the, um, the way again, this will be new for some of you, but when you walk around, you're constantly attending to objects, constantly, constantly, constantly. This is several times a second, and you do that vision and touch and hearing and so on. And what we believe is going on each time you attend to an object, you you're actually calculating its displacement from a, a larger parent object. So if I walk in, into a room and I see a table, I quickly say, oh, we're, I quickly calculate, just look at the table. My brain calculates where the table is relative to the room. If I then look at um, a dish on the table, uh, it'll calculate where the dish is relative to the table. If I, if I look on a, uh, a pattern on the dish, it'll calculate where the pattern is relative to the dish. This, this happens all the time. You, you just, and this is how the model of the world is built. You just constantly just building um, this sort of hierarchical structure as you look at uh, as you go around and tend to things, it's always, it's always calculating its position all to something else. And what we have to do is remember those displacement cells and that's your model of, of the things you're looking at. I know that's a lot. If you haven't been exposed to this, you have no idea what I'm talking about probably. Um, we also know we have to learn to sequences of displacement vectors. Um, and because uh, some objects have behaviors and that's how you uh, learn behaviors. In the paper, we use the example of a stapler and how the stapler opens and closes and that's something you've learned. So how do you know, how do, what does it mean to know that a stapler opens and closes? It means that you have to learn um, that the displacement between the different parts of the stapler and how those displacements change over time. So a sequence of displacements represents, um, a sequence of the segment, displacement backwards represents a behavior of an object. Uh, and so we know it has to do that. And uh, we also know that the column has to maintain a state of the object. It specifies its current uh, set of displacements. So again, the staple could be open or closed. My cell phone may have one app on it or another app on it. It's still the same cell phone. I have the same reference frame, but I need to know the state of the object in order to know what uh, exactly is going to be visible or what its position and morphology will be at any point in time. So this is a hell of a lot of stuff to go on in a cortical column. And over the years, we've talked about this a lot. Some of you, this is a lot of this will be new to you. Um, we've talked about all these issues and how they might get resolved. And what I'm trying to do basically, we're trying to map all these functions onto a cortical column. So what I've been doing the last few months is just thinking about these very broadly trying to gel some sort of scheme by which we can make all this happen. Um, I'm just going to talk about one idea I've been working on this last couple of weeks. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating because I, I'm stuck, but not really stuck. I'm just like it's puzzling and I haven't really been, been able to decide whether it's a great idea or not yet. And, but it's exciting to think about. So I'm just gonna talk about that one idea and then I'll be I'm done for the day. And so I've been asking myself, how does this bi-directional reference frame transform could occur? We haven't spent a lot of time on that in the past. So uh, it's like, a, okay, that's a big thing. How could that occur? And the more you think about it, the harder it is to imagine. It's like, how, do, you know, how does a single column take you know, coordinates from one reference frame and transfer the coordinates to another reference frame? So here's the idea I've been working on. Um, recall that uh, this is a slide I showed you once before. This is just showing what a mini column is. A mini column is a set of cells basically that goes across all layers of the cortex. And uh, the hypothesis um, that I had proposed that mini columns represent a 1D movement vector. And the complex cells, these are cells that respond to movement in some direction, uh, represent a velocity in a 1D movement vector. It's like, okay, my eye is moving this way or my body is moving forward or it's going at some angle. Um, some uh, complex cell will respond uh, to that and, um, and it represents movement in that direction. And so a mini comp that basically represents a, a 1D movement vector. And so uh, therefore we would expect in a mini comp we perform path integration and we calculate displacements. This is a really nice idea. Um, however, there's a problem with this idea uh, and if a minicom contains some cells that are egocentric and other cells that are allocentric, which it, by definition, since all the cells are in minicoms, that's going to have to be the case. Because um, we know that the inputs to this column are going to be an egocentric form and, uh, and, and we know this is going to be an allocentric model. Um, uh, then, then, then all the cells in the minicom cannot have the same basic orientation preferences. They all can't represent the movement in the same direction because, you know, how I move on the objects is going to be different. How, I, you know, if I move, if I'm moving straight in, uh, relative or turning left all to, the ob to an object, it might in a different dimension depending on the orientation object. So it, it's essentially would suggest that one of the, the basic principles, I think people think about mini columns, they say, well, all the cells in the mini column in V1, for example, all have the same orientation preference. Um, and this would say that can't be true 
Uh, now, there's a whole bunch of caveats here. First of all, when they talk about that, they're talking about less than 50% of the cells, um, a little bit less than 50% of the cells. The other 50% of the cells, they don't know what they do at all, so they're not preserving that. But one of, the, one of those older papers that I, I talked about before, which is talking about the optic, the flow idea, pointed out that they found sometimes cells, um, complex cells that had a different orientation preference than let's say layer four cells in the same mini column. It's not like, you know, you stick the probe in and the idea is that all these cells have the same orientation preference. That's not true. And it may be true under artificial conditions, but they really found some evidence under some conditions that's not true. They find that they're completely different. Um, so this would be an important sort of a guess. And so the idea I'm working on right now is this idea that the, perhaps the upper layers are allocentric and the lower layers are egocentric, uh, meaning that they're, 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 they are, they're, we're converting a movement from one into another. Um, uh, it's sort of in the mini columns. And, and um, let me just give you one more slide. Uh, just, oh, just to remind you, um, this maybe gets back to something, this goes back to something I showed earlier. These are complex cells in V1, and these are representing their cell responses. And the, the important point of this slide is um, that the cells in the lower layers have much broader receptor fields in general than the cells in the upper layers. Um, the cells in the upper layers also tend to be much more end stop, meaning they, uh, the darker they are here, meaning that if, this, if, the, if the input gets even wider than they're shown, it, it gets a bigger, you know, wider amount of the retina or wider amount of the visual field, the cells stop responding. They're like, they say, I only want to respond to small things that are moving. I don't want to respond to big things that are moving. Whereas the lower layer tend to be like, we want to respond to big things and the bigger, the better. And so the, so the idea that I, I proposed before and I'm working on again now is that these, these lower cells, the lower layers, essentially imagine they're rep representing the broadest receptive field possible. And so if I detect optic flow over the entire visual field, that tells me that I'm moving relative to the world. That's, that's what that means. It means I'm moving, the things in the world are moving, I'm moving because everything I'm looking at is moving, therefore my eye is moving. Whereas if, if a small part of the receptive field is moving, um, I can't be certain what that represents. Um, if it's end stopped, meaning if it, it, then it means that if like the darker ones here, that tells me that the thing that's moving isn't over the entire receptive field because if it were, then that cell wouldn't be responding. Um, so it says I'm looking at something that's in a much smaller part of the receptive field that I only want to focus on that. Now this gets back, I think the question you asked Kevin, earlier, early Kevin is like, well, one, under what conditions would you, these things agree and what conditions would they disagree? There's, there seems to be a possibility of calculating something here. I can say there's something that's moving that's a small part of my receptive field, but my large part of the receptive field is not moving. That means I'm not moving, but the thing I'm looking at is moving. That's like, okay, that means the thing that I'm attending to is moving, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's moving not because I'm moving, because of my, if, my, if my, my lower cells were not active, but only the upper cells, then it would say, yeah, that's gotta be, um, something, the thing I'm attending to is moving, that's movement of the object. Um, and so I've been trying to think through the different combinations of calculations you can do here under, you know, uh, uh, as these, as graded cells, these cells are graded responses, then, you know, what can I calculate based on the, how much I'm moving in a particular direction that the lower cells here versus how much the thing I'm looking at is changing. Um, and under different uh, orientations, if, if the upper idea, if the upper cells represented some sort of allocentric um, movement vector, um, then, um, then the amount that, you know, how much the, there'd be a varying grade of differential response between these upper and lower cells. Perhaps this will become clear. I mean, what did I say here? Let me see here. Um, uh, first of all, I want to point out that this is sort of a ubiquitous property of the cortex, these large and small RFs, uh, meaning receptive fields in the upper layers are small and the lower layers are large. This is a huge clue. This is not there for nothing. These, this, this is like a ubiquitous property of the cortex. There, it must be there for a reason. You know, it's not, it's, it, and we, and it, it's an important thing. It's a huge feature of the cortex. Um, and there I already said what I said a moment ago, end stop small RF represents movement of a subset of a field of view. And the question is, can, we, can the differential firing of the uh, of large and small RF complex fields be used to perform reference frame transform. That is the idea I'm working on. Here's one more slide um, to talk about it. This is sort of the, the standard view of, a, of how a, cord, a V1 cortical column looks, where in one dimension, so we're looking at a slice of the cortex here, a little cortical column. In one dimension, you see a change of orientation. It's, in one dimension, 
But if you go in the other dimension, orthogonal dimension, um, we have what they call iso orientation slabs. All the cells there seem to respond to the same uh, basic orientation. Um, and um, so we've talked about this quite a bit. I've even proposed how this could be, play a role in, in, uh, in learning uh, voltage controlled oscillators for grid cells. Um, but this is a pretty standard feature we see. Um, what I'm exploring the idea now is this different thing. It's the idea that the, that the, uh, that the lower layers have um, uh, ego um, movement vectors. Uh, that is the, these layers five and layer six cells that respond to these broad areas. Um, and the upper layers are somehow are allo movement vectors. And we're using this crossbar sort of orientation to figure out how to calculate, how to transform from one to the other. A few observations I'll make about this. Uh, because we see these slabs and they're very prevalent, there must be mechanisms that make it happen. This is not gonna happen on its own. So there has, to be, there has to be a cellular mechanism to make these things behave this way. Um, uh, you know, whether it's an inhibitory cell or not, we don't really know yet, but it's not something that's gonna happen on its own. Um, and so that's an interesting question because if we can figure out what that mechanism is, I can ask, does that mechanism apply equally to upper and lower layers? Uh, do we see a difference in how that works? Um, it's likely that slabs play a functional role. I've already said that. It's, it's not like they're there, you know, they're there. They're, they're, they, the brain wouldn't be organized this way if they didn't do something. Um, and then the question I'm asking, could there be orthogonal slabs in upper and lower layers, which is a very speculative idea. No one's uh, proposing that generally, I think. But as I said, there's evidence that, that there are differences that the lower layers do respond to different orientations of the upper layers. On the most experimental paradigms, you wouldn't notice that perhaps. So if you just you know, anesthetize the animal and you expose it to some you know, sinusoidal grading, you might not see that. Um, it requires you know, actively attending to objects at different orientations. Um, so I said there is evidence for that. And so the question is, could this, could there be, this be calculating, uh, calculating the reference frame transformation? Remember the paper I reviewed um, a few weeks ago or a month ago? It, I forget who the authors were. I think it was, was it Burgess, I can't remember. They, they did, it was a review paper about the, um, uh, the vector cells and the different types of vector cells, you know, object vector and boundary vector cells and so on. Um, and they had this proposed sort of, um, I don't have the picture with me right now, but they had this proposed way that you could convert between uh, reference frames of like allocentric uh, reference cells and egocentric reference cells. And they argued that both types uh, vector cells and they argued that both types of vector cells exist they give evidence for that, or so there's these egocentric vector cells and these allocentric vector cells, and they, and they propose this sort of almost like a crossbar um, um, proposal. It looks very much like what I'm showing here on the right, um, where as a mechanism for how you could um, transfer between allocentric and egocentric reference frames. And so I was inspired by that, uh, that figure um, and, and said, hey, you know, could that be happening in the cortex here as well? So, I didn't totally make this up. I got inspired by that paper um, uh, in, that, in that proposal that I showed. So um, I'm trying to walk through the mechanisms that how this might work um, and what kind of calculations you could do uh, based on these sort of uh, uh, differential observations of movements um, in the upper and lower layers between the upper complex cells and the lower complex cells. Um, and it's, it's challenging. It would be fun to sit at a whiteboard with a few of you to go through this and try to walk it through, but I, I, I'm not going to do that. I don't know how to do that today. Um, so anyway, this is, the, this is the idea I'm working on. I would say um, it's highly speculative at this point in time, but I think there must be a very, very basic mechanism for doing reference frame transforms that ties into the whole mini column hypothesis that mini columns represent um, uh, movement vectors, because I think that's true. And um, so it, there's got to be an answer lurking here that looks something like this. So that's the end of my, my speculative presentation. How do you think kind of location representations fit into this? If, if we have egocentric vectors and allocentric vectors, does that mean that the upper layers have an allocentric location signal and a well, lower um, layers have an mean like a location signal like a, a, a grid cell? Yeah, like a set of grid cell modules or... Yeah, I think that's what the implication would be the case. Now, you made the argument, personally to me the, uh, a few weeks ago, you made the point that we don't necessarily have to have grid cells in both reference frames. Right. right? We do have to have grid cells in the allocentric reference frame. Um, that's the basic of, basis of the model. I think that's 
I think that's correct. I'm not sure, but I think that's correct. Um, so, but we don't have to necessarily have um, uh, grid cells in the, in the, in the egocentric reference chain. So the thing I'm thinking about right now is can I convert a movement vector uh, on its own? Just like, hey, I'm moving this amount in this direction relative to my body. How does that translate to movement in a vector relative to the object? And without necessarily co converting that to a grid cell, can I just convert? Um, you know what I'm saying? Does that? Yeah. That might, no, yeah. you could. Yeah. I mean, with coordinate in a coordinate system, it's very easy to do that. It's just hard to think about in neural representations. Yeah, so. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so exactly. If you just want to do the math, it's not so hard. But, but, um, but there, there has to be a fundamental neural mechanisms to do this. It, it, it's, it now becomes convinced it's like the, sort of the heart of every sort of column. It has to be doing these transforms back and forth. Um, and there's a lot of things that smell right about this. You know, they just like, okay, we everyone for 50 years have talked about upper and lower layers and how they're sort of separate circuits and how they interact with one another. Um, this idea that they're, you know, the size of the receptor fields are quite different in the upper and lower layers. Now we know that there's two sets of complex cells in the upper and lower layers. They're both independently derived. We know that. So the lower complex cells do not require the, the upper complex cells to and the upper complex cells do not require lower complex cells. And the upper complex cells don't require input from layer four. If you disable, the, disable layer four, you still got complex cells in, in layer two, three. So, um, so there's, and, and so this is like ubiquitous ideas. And um, anyway, just, there's a number of things like that that sort of say, hey, you know, what are these slabs for? And why do we have that? And so, and, and so I don't, and again, and then, you know, so this, this idea that somehow we're, we're going to, I haven't been able to articulate it yet, but somehow we're going to be able to calculate that by looking at these differential responses is appealing. Um, it's not, it's, it's hard to think of ways that we could do this transform using neurons, as you just said, to the It's not easy, um, yet it has to be done ubiquitously throughout the cortex. And so uh, this is, you know, I, I also don't think there's something to be done elsewhere. It's not like I'm going to ship this information over to striatum or something and the striatum is going to ship it back. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't seem right to me. It's like, it's gotta be happening everywhere. So, um, yeah, I don't know. More questions, more suggestions. <laughs> it's interesting what you were saying before about the experiments being done in static paradigms. I think there's a bunch of evidence now that as soon as you start introducing movement and things like that, all of those classic receptive field properties just go completely <laughs> yeah. out of whack. And yeah. you know, I've heard this also anecdotally from neuroscientists, they just don't know what to make of it because any theory they had doesn't hold anymore. As soon as you start, as soon as the animal has started to move, allowed to move, no matter, almost doesn't matter what the movement is, all of these re response properties just go completely wacky. Well, that, and that, yeah, and that, and it yeah. makes sense. Again, if you think about like, I'm an experimentalist and I have an anesthetized animal and I'm trying to figure out what, or even if they're not anesthetized, I'm just showing them, you know, sinusoidal gratings or, you know, bars that are moving or something, what they would classically do, Obviously, if I have a if I have an end stopped uh, complex cell in, in layer three, if I show it a large bar, it doesn't respond. So they should narrow the bar down and say, "Oh, look, it responds at this orientation." And then they go down to the lower layers and they say, "Oh, look, this cell responds much better if I make it wider and I move it." You know, and so, so um, they're basically changing the input to to to, to match, and that's what you're going to get. You know, <laughs> it's like. It's, until you have this different, it's the idea is you have a differential response between the, the, that's the thing I'm working on. Well, how do I use the differential response between the upper complex cells and the lower complex cells? So I'm trying to imagine an object and I'm, I'm rotating the object or I'm moving my eye over the object. The object's moving on its own. What would be the differential responses of those two cells? Um, and what could I infer from that? Um, There's been some interesting neuroanatomy studies that are consistent with some of the stuff you're saying. They've shown that layer five output cells, contrary to the canonical layer four, layer two, three to layer five flow, the layer five output cells fire first um, before layer four and they get direct thalamic input. And if you inactivate layer four, they still fire. So yeah. there's, there's an interesting idea that there are their, their own independent processing stream of egocentric maybe. Um, yeah, I think, I think that is, yeah. I think that is the, you know, the classic view, there's a, there's a, there's an input from the thalamus to the lower layer five, right at the, you know, and, um, 
And that would be, that would be the, the, the thing that generates that complex yeah. cell resp response, right? And what I think, what I think and, and, those, and layer five, of course, is the motor output layer, right? Yeah. Right. So, so what I think is going on there is, is, is it's quite, very quickly deciding, okay, um, we're, uh, we're detecting a flow in a certain direction. Uh, there's a spatial pooler like, um, you can look at this figure on the screen here, you know, that we talked about the different uh, ISO orientation. Um, it, it, each, of these, each of these divisions, I'm showing on the lower layer would be a different movement vector. Um, so with the cortex is saying, okay, given all my flow patterns, I'm going to do like a spatial pooler thing and figure out what I'm coming up with a set of flow ve movement vectors. And so each of these, each of these um, slabs, if you will, would represent a a movement vector that's basically just a complex cell and that complex cell you can now project right back to the cpg and say i'm gonna I, i'm representing the movement you just did i'm representing the movement you're you're performing right now your eye is moving and i'm representing it because i'm firing and um and and so we're going to learn the connection between layer five and the cpg we're going to say okay the layer five cell is representing this movement as detected by flow and i we're going to form synapses to the cpg that's performing that movement right at that moment and so this is how the cortex learns to control movement by saying, I've modeled the movement. Um, and now here it is, <laughs> let's form connections, whoever cells that are making that movement happen at this time. So it's, it's a way of, uh, we don't have to assume any knowledge of what the CPG looks like in the cortex. It uh, just projects it. I think I went off on a rant there, but um, um, yeah. So I think Max, you're, what, what we, this is just review here very clearly. There are, there are three areas that in a, in a cortical column that get input from the thalamus. There's, a, there's layer four, which clearly gets um, the, um, the parvocellular input. Um, there is a lower layer three and a, and a lower layer five. And um, what we have speculated is that, that, the, um, that the lower layer three and the lower layer five are getting um, magnocellular input. Although I do not, I don't think we had evidence for that, um, but that's what I'm speculating because that would explain why those cells or complex cell behaviors exist. And they don't, as you said, they don't require layer four. If you, if you disable layer four, yep. these complex cells still respond. So this idea, you're right, that this idea that flows from four to three to five and stuff, that's not, it's true, but it's not necessary. Yeah, um, it's not a requirement. So these, so it's, again, this idea that the cortex is figuring out these movement vectors on its own. It's doing a, a transformation, on, you know, on its own, and then later, um, it can, um, then it can take the input to layer four and, and 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 start using that as like, okay, what have I, what am I seeing at this location? You know, after I've done my path integration, or if I know where I am, uh, what am I, what am I observing at that location? Uh, On the topic of location and orientation, um, not, and not so much on the topic of movement, um, sometimes the egocentric, allocentric terminology can be am ambiguous in the following sense. Um, sometimes it's more useful to think of, is this a, there are two types of location. You can have the spatial relationship between the viewer and the, and the object, um, or you can have a spatial relationship between the object and another object. Uh, and the first kind, spatial relationship between viewer and object, arguably that's what grid cells are. Uh, an animal moving around, you, you could, if you squint your eyes, grid cells are, uh, are actually tracking the egocentric location of the environment relative to the animal. Uh, that they're, they're oh, well, I was almost <laughs> yeah. that. The egocentric yeah. location of the environment. Are you just flipping around? You're saying who's yeah. your viewer? Uh, uh, okay, but I'm having trouble deeply. But, but if the if the mouse the kind of turns was around an animal. and goes back to the same location, yeah, the the grid cell will still the same grid cell will fire, right? So right. it's not because the environment it's independent of a, it's independent of the pose of the animal relative to the environment. What do you mean? Uh, as the animal turns, that its grid cells and head direction cells collectively represent the spatial relationship between the animal and the environment. You can Correct. call but that allocentric, you can call it egocentric. He's, no, he's good from, from the reference frame of the room, it's egocentric. It's ego, if, if, if the room was an animal, it's encoding the egocentric representation of the room. No, no but I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying 
Collect collectively, the location and orientation, grid cells and head direction cells are, six, are well, suppose it was in 3D. It's a six dimensional representation of the spatial relationship between the animal and the room. And if you split it apart, yes, the grid cells on their own are more allocentric. But yeah, that's what I was saying, yeah. Yes, yes, this grid, the grid cells on their own. It's like the system has decided to split the six dimensions into something that is allocentric, but the space, the fundamentally, the spatial relationship is between the animal and the room, um, and that's like one fundamental type of look of 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 spatial relationship. The other fundamental type is between two external objects, between the logo and the coffee cup, the the carpet in the room, and um, and sometimes it's more useful to think to draw the line right there as, as like that's how you rather than thinking egocentric and allocentric think of external spatial relationships and and uh, sorry and 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 spatial relationships between you and the outside world hey, and, hey mark yeah Marcus, go on uh, so so i actually don't like using ego and allo and when i've been taking notes on this i haven't been using those i put those in this presentation so that it would be easier for other people to understand I just been thinking about it, and I'm wondering how you think about this. And I'm bringing this up to say this, this sort of address what you're thinking. I'm thinking there's just there's just reference frame one and reference frame two. It's like you know, Doctor Seuss thing one and thing two, and um, and I just I need to go back and forth between two reference frames. I don't really care what they are because in where columns and what columns, other columns, who knows what they represent? They're not you know, it's just between two reference frames, um, and this seems to be like the thing I have to do um, everywhere. And of course, it could be abstract things too. So, so yeah, one to me, that's a much cleaner way of thinking about it. Then we just rep define what thing one is and thing two is, yeah. and now you have the. Okay, so maybe I can start yeah. doing that because I didn't do that here because I just want to. It, it it helps initially to start thinking about like, oh, what are you talking about, reference frame one and reference frame two? Um, it, it, it helps to think about ego and allo as a sort of a placeholder for that. Um, so, if I just started doing that, Marcus, would would that sort of address what you're talking about, or are you talking about something different? No, I mean that that's good. I got that that would make sense. that would work. Uh, so I wanted to draw this distinction because um, not now using this terminology. Um, so one one thing that where Jeff Hinton's work kind of changed over the years was back in the eighties. He would talk a lot about um, about both the both types of representation the viewer centric one and the object centric representation and, and the, these two types. And one interesting change that happened when capsules came along is um, he no longer has the object centric uh, representations in, uh, in the neurons anymore. So he no longer has them in the activations. They're all, that information is only in the weights. Uh, the, the spatial relationship between parent objects and child objects, uh, spatial relationships between things is, is only captured ever in the weights. And, and so like a capsule a version of the brain or whatever wouldn't require neurons to represent allocentric locations. Hmm. But I have to make allocentric, I have to make, I have to do calculations in the allocentric space. Like yes. if I, I want to get from point A and point B in, in an allocentric space, I have to be able to calculate that, um, right? I mean, it's not like, uh, and therefore to me to do that, I think I need activations. I can't just say there are no activations. It's, um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I think that, yes, I can tell you where that would fit into capsules, but it's, 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 I'm sort of start changing the subject a little bit too much. It's almost like they would represent that as part of the state of the object. Uh, they, they would have like a, they call them instantiation parameters and they would update the state of the object in a way that captures whether the stapler's opening or the, the animal's moving its limbs or, or sorry, the, the, uh, the, the object you're viewing is, is moving in some strange way. Uh, that's the best I can say there. I think that there is an, a, a, a nice insight in capsules that, uh, that you don't necessarily always need to use activations to mm. store this information. Some of it can go into connections. You know, I, I, I know every time I read about capsules, it's very sort of a, a mathematical. I have trouble relating. To you, you are right that it, it relies on matrix, matrix multiplications yeah. and stuff like that.
you know, there's one thing, Max. There's some nice. That's it. And, I was just going to say, there's some nice blog posts. I don't know if you've seen Jeff on uh, on Capsule Networks that kind of break it down a bit more intuitively than than <laughs> the original papers, which I think were potentially deliberately written to be as uh, incomprehensible as possible. <laughs> if, you, if, if you if you want to share that blog post, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I can do. I'll do that. I, I was going to mention there was something that Max presented the other day um, that caught my eye. And, uh, and, and I didn't mention it here, but I, I've been thinking about it. Max had proposed that the layer six simple cells um, were a uh, prediction uh, of the next uh, input. And, um, and so, I, and I was, I'm not sure I buy that yet, but the idea that they represent um, uh, uh, a, a different point in time of the input, right? So you would say, oh, the layer forward simple cells would be um, the current input, but then layer six cells would be prediction of the next input. I think that's what Max presented. Correct me if I got that wrong, Max. Um, and, um, and that was an interesting idea. And because one of the things that displacement cells requires, displacement cells require that we compare two locations. Um, that's, that's what you need to do to calculate a displacement cell is uh, you have to say, okay, now those two locations could be two locations in the same reference frame, meaning the same object space. There's, and in that case, you know, I haven't re-anchored, I've only moved. Um, and in that case, it represents a distance or movement vector. If the two locations are in different objects, meaning it's, I can't, I didn't just move from one to the other, but I, I re-anchored, um, then they represent the relative location um, like the, the logo on the coffee cup. And so, so that was, a, it's a, I was talking to Marcus about the other day, it's, it was a really beautiful idea that this same mechanism could do both of these, but it does require that, um, that you have to compare, the, the displacement cells are gonna be somehow calculating this based on two different um, uh, uh, locations. And in the past, when we first introduced the idea of displacement cells, it, we, we kind of sort of said like, well, you're moving and at the moment you transition from the last point to the next point, then you could calculate it. But the idea that perhaps layer six and, and layer four represent, or maybe some, something in the upper layers, but let's say layer four, um, represent these two different, uh, well, not layer four, but wherever it is, you got, that I might have two locations, two simple cells that are representing, not locations, two different uh, um, patterns. And I'm, and I'm trying to, um, the idea that the lower and the upper layers are going to represent two different points in time. Um, and um, in that, like, as Max said, okay, well, if layer six is representing a prediction, then I would, I, then I could compare the prediction to my current input and that would, that would be a displacement or uh, perhaps layer six represented the last input. So maybe layer six is a delayed input. It's like what I just had. Um, and now uh, I get a new input. Um, and so that's the opposite, it's T minus one versus T plus one. And so now I've been able to calculate this. The point is the calculating displacements, which we know has to occur in some form, requires the comparing these two different locations. And it would be really nice if those locations were coincident in time, uh, as opposed to just a transition, which seems harder to manage. And so the idea that, um, that you could have um, uh, two different representations of the input in different, I, again, it's very confusing. Uh, um, have you read, do you have any thoughts on, because in hippocampal recordings as a rat traverses a track, you don't actually see, in my understanding, a single place cell activating. What you see is a sequence on the theta rhythm of the place cells just prior and the expected place cells in the future. You're, talking about the, you're talking about the procession? The, the... Yeah, 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 the procession. And you usually yeah. see a sequence of activation of place cells which is kind of the, the most recent past and the expected next few place cells. Yeah. Have you thought about that as being applicable here? Well, it, what we've talked about here is that all the mechanisms, I mean, place cells and grid cells show this precession phenomena. Um, now, there's, there's two things there. One is it just that a cell, as you approach, you know, the cell, um, uh, where the cell fires in the theta cycle tells you where you are, right. <laughs> in some yep. sense. Um, and the other the idea is that in a very short period of a part of a cycle of the theta cycle, 
that you play th through a sequence. I think that might have been what you were just talking about. Um, so there's there's two uh, there's two things that you see in the hippocampus in my based on what I've read. Um, there's these sharp wave ripples, which is a rapid replay of a sequence, yes, either yes. forward or backwards. Yes. But not not the ripples, just as I'm traversing on the theta rhythm, the first gamma, let's say there's place A, B, C, and D. If I'm at place C, it'll quickly replay A, B, and then it will also replay C and D. And the C will be at the center of the theta rhythm, but it's actually playing both what is behind me and playing what's in front of me in a single theta cycle as I'm traversing it. But there would be different cells that fired then, right? Yeah, that it's correct. Be... It's, different, yeah. it's different place cells firing. Well, you can, you can call it a sequence, or you could just say these place cells are firing early and these place cells are firing late. Um, well, I think where I was going to get with this, everything that we've ever read about um, how grid cells come about uh, in place cells, but um, is that it requires this um, differential um, firing frequency Theta, theta frequency. There's this yep. idea that, you know, the whole, the, the, the prominent mechanism is you got two cells that are firing in lockstep in theta. And when you're moving, one starts firing a slightly faster, very slightly faster rhythm. And, and therefore, which cells are in sync and which cells are out of sync becomes, it changes. And this is the basic way that grid cells come about. And, and, that, and that explains all the precession stuff that people observe. Um, so I kind of buy into that, and uh, I think, uh, and so I think that's going on here as well. And uh, I, I, in the past, I made a, I, I, I explored different ideas that where how this could be happening in the cortical architecture. Uh, I'm not happy with any one of those at the moment, um, but I do think it's it's when I say that a cortical column has to create you know an allocentric grid cell, my assumption is that it's doing that using a mechanism where there's a, a uh, essentially a beating effect between the two theta rhythms um, and uh, that that has to exist here and whether there's there's this one idea is that you have a set of cells each firing at a different phase in the theta rhythm mm -hmm. and, and that requires a set of cells and there's another idea that each dendrite branch on an individual cell could be firing at a different theta rhythm that's another proposal that people had so I, I think the verdict is still out on this yeah. it's, you know but it has to occur somehow, some way. Um, by the way, just one more thing that, that I've mentioned in the past, but you know, it comes into this as well, is that you know, when we observe, let's say vision, and uh, I'm looking at some object, and I'm moving my eyes to attend to the different parts of the object. Now, I, if I say, oh, I need to attend to the coffee cup handle, I need to come to the lip, how much I move my eye depends on how far away it is, of course, right? So the, 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 the angles attended by my eye movement changes depending on the, di the distance. And yet we're not, you know, we do this just automatically, just don't even, we don't even think about it. Um, and um, so that tells me that the movement vector coming out of a cortical column um, has to vary based on some sort of distance metric like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea there is that the, 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 the theta rhythm itself, the scaling of the theta rhythm itself is a perfect way to adjust all these things. Right? I could, I could essentially by changing the theta rhythm, I can have the eye move further or less depend on the same movement. It's, it's sort of like um, that frequency could be the encoding of distance, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and we and we do this. Another example we've given is like you know I can pick up a coffee cup, but then I can pick up a little demi tasse coffee cup, which is small, but it's it's a small version of the coffee cup. But I can still manipulate it just like I can do the bigger cup. So how do I do that? You know, it's like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like it's so we, it seems that this inherent ability to scale um, is uh, is an important capability. Another example is like you, you can write your name, um, you know, with a large lettering, or you can write it with a very small lettering. It's the same motor behavior, yet somehow I can make it big, and somehow I can make it small. Right. And um, and so it's not like I memorize it big and small. I I don't <laughs> take it. And I, so there there has to be a general scaling mechanism. Um, that applies, and uh, I, I've argued in the past. Uh, you talked about the. I think you. I can't remember if you talked about this. Yeah, you What's did interesting the, too, the matrix, about the, matrix the, idea, the idea of scaling is interesting too, because it also is an alternative explanation for various visual um, illusion phenomena. Like I'm sure you've seen the one with the bigger circle with smaller circles, and the same size circle with smaller circles around it. You perceive 
the, the center circle relative to the surrounding circles. That's based mm -hmm. on its relative size, not its absolute size, which would be explained by what you're describing, which is your mind yeah. creates an invariant object representation that can be scaled up and down. Yes. Different yeah, things. that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it in terms of optical illusions, but it's an interesting observation. So um, again, this is like a, I think the scaling factor is something that's, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, and so it has to be a major um, architectural feature of the cortex. Um, I've, I've proposed that this is, this could be done with the matrix cells and the thalamus, which, um, which project broadly to layer one and other places and could encode timing. I think it's somewhat consistent with you proposed to, I, I forget now, but, um, but anyway, um, yeah. So these, again, that's another requirement that the cortex has to be able to do. And, um, and so, you know, I'm trying to resolve all these things at once, if I could possibly do it. Because <laughs> we've been spending years talking about these things individually, and then, you know, and then how do we integrate them all together? It's, it's tricky.